I'm Bonnie Hackbarth, and I am delighted to be here to talk about working with the media and how to get more media coverage and better media coverage. And by better media coverage, I mean the stories that we want and that we think need to be told that will help move forward our mission. We can't do every job that needs to be done out there. When I worked at the Federal Trade Commission, we can't bring every single lawsuit out there that needs to be brought. We have to get the most mileage out of what it is that we can do. And part of that is by sharing our stories with the media so that people understand what's available and what's out there and can be advocates for themselves. Okay, so that's why media is really important. It's why I love what I do. You'll find I don't use words like spin and things like that. There are people who abuse the media. There are media who abuse sources. We understand that. What we're talking about here today is how to do it the right way, the best way, the most respectful way, the, may, the way with the most integrity. We're talking about working with the media to move our mission forward. Stories contain messages. They contain calls to action. Very often when you see a story in the media, it starts with an individual. Joe Smith was dealing with this issue, and here's what happened. And then it moves out to the bigger policy or the bigger program sort of issue. And so one of the things that reporters are always going to be asking us for is that individual, that person who can help illustrate the story. And then they're going to want what pictures and visuals as well. So the first thing I always invite people to do as they think about working with the media is in everything you do, think about what kind of visuals and what kind of people can help tell your story. Because even if you're not the media relations person or the communications director or the person who writes the newsletter, you're working with the people who are affected every single day. And so as you work with these people, you know, think about, gee, this person might be willing to tell their story in our newsletter or to the media or something about how well this program is working or about why there's a need for a different program. Obviously, we have to have some sensitivity there. You know, we're talking about individual people and we have to have their permission and we have to make sure that they're handled with integrity. Um, but this is an important thing for us to think about at the very beginning. And when I first went to work in the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, the first thing I did is I met with all the lead attorneys on the investigations. And I said, I need visuals while you're out there investigating. You know, if it's a telemarketing scam, I need that fur coat, and I need that diamond necklace, and I need, but I also need some people who were victimized by this so that they can talk about why it was so beguiling or that kind of thing so that other people can learn from that. So these are important things to think about. We can have control over our interview, and control is not a bad word here. Um, control is the opportunity to make sure that our message, what we have to say, is in the story. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about day, today, is how do I make sure that what I want to share, number one, gets a story, and number two, is in stories that are already out there. Okay. You can't have complete control, however, and I have a fun little story about, again, this is when I was at the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC um, ultimately sued Toys R Us after a long investigation, and the allegation was that Toys R Us used its market power to keep the wholesale stores like Costco and Sam's Club from selling certain products. In other words, if you want to sell a toy in America successfully, you probably got to sell it at Toys R Us. And this was particularly true before the internet. <laughs> okay, so this was in the early 1990s. And what we alleged is that Toys R Us used that power to say, Sam's Club, Costco, you can't sell that Barbie in your store. You can, o you can only sell a packaged Barbie or a, or a slight revision of that Barbie or whatever. And so in order to tell this story, I went to Toys R Us and I bought some Barbies. And our competition director was a gentleman who had four sons. So he'd never held a Barbie in his life. And so he picked up that Barbie doll in front of a dozen cameras in the back of the room, and I was in the back of the room, held it up with his finger up her dress. <laughs> yeah, nothing I could do about it. <laughs> you know? So that was, a, that was a something that happened that I just could not envision. I couldn't control it. Another example of not totally being able to control the media is we did um, bring about two dozen cases simultaneously in coordination with the FBI, the Federal Trade Commission did, and they were all telemarketing cases. And these weren't suits against the individual boiler rooms, the, the call centers that were calling you to say invest in this or buy gold or do whatever. These were the suppliers for 
the telemarketing boiler rooms. These were like the roots to the dandelions. If you think of the boiler rooms as the dandelions, these were the roots. And so we had about a dozen cases going on all over the country, and we had planned this news conference with the FBI weeks and weeks in advance, and these raids were going on simultaneously all over the country of these supplier organizations. The news conference was scheduled at a time certain, let's say 10 a.m. About an hour before, the FBI arrested the gentleman who bombed the parking garage in the World Trade Center. This was prior to 9-11, the parking garage was bombed. Nobody at the FBI that day asked about telemarketing, despite months and months of planning on our part. There's not a thing we can do about that, and that's okay. We just held our press conference, gave them the information, and then got out of the way, let the FBI answer all the questions, and then the next day I made a whole bunch of calls, <laughs> provided more background, provided uh, photographs and video of people talking, and we got some coverage, a lot less than we would have gotten with what you would normally think of as a joint FTC chairman and FBI press conference. You can't control everything. It's a day's work and you do the best that you can. The impact of the Affordable Care Act in Kentucky. And we did quarterly reports and annual reports. And these annual reports talked about a ton of stuff. And so while it was only one report that we were writing news releases on, we'd write four or five news releases. And we'd put them out a couple of days apart from each other. Lo and behold, they all got picked up. It was interesting information, the health you know, reform is a big issue, and it got picked up, but it was way too much for reporters to assimilate. And so we would do a news release just on one or two aspects of each one. And then we just put them out, same background document, but we'd put out different news releases. It worked. So if you have things like that where you have different elements of a, of a study that you're doing or a program that you're announcing, um, and it's complicated, break it down. Make it easier. Okay. Always put quotes, graphics, and supporting information. You notice the inverted pyramid. I don't know how many of you have seen that. The point of that inverted pyramid is that the least important information is at the bottom. The most important information is, the, is at the top. The idea is that if a reporter actually just uses your news release and cuts it off at any one point, the letter, lesser important information is at the bottom. Okay. At the very bottom, you do need links to actual supporting documents and a boilerplate. Grad is, or this program is, the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky is. That's your chance to tell them how you want to be described. Okay. We're working on ours. I need to simplify it a little bit, but I got a board to go through. <laughs> so we're working on it. Okay. Questions about the body of the news release and, and the format of a news release. Okay. Over on the side, local angle. Really, really critical. As a statewide organization, I try very, very hard to do regional news releases when I can that talk about just that area. Okay? It's much easier for Jacob Dick at the Owensboro Messenger Inquirer to write a story if he's got a local angle on it. And so I will try to find some piece of information in my cover note to him or whatever that talks about a local angle or suggests a local angle for him. Same thing with local sources. That is a way to localize it. So I might put in a quote for the news release that goes to Western Kentucky from someone who lives in Western Kentucky, someone who administers a program in Western Kentucky. Okay. Visuals we've talked about. That's graphics. It's pictures. It's whatever that you can create, whatever exists or that you can create that illustrates the story. You know that if you have a visual and the newspaper uses it, or the TV reporter uses it behind their head, it's got more attention. It's going to get more coverage. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. Is the, the reason for that is because it's visual. Okay? Visual applies not only to TV, but it also applies to print and online. And then interactive elements wherever you can. I always put a ton of hyperlinks in my news release, links to other organizations, links to the report, links to prior news releases that are related to it. You see that a lot more in stories these days in the media. You'll see, especially their online versions, they'll just have a word highlighted and it'll be hyperlinked to a previous story on that particular topic. Let's do that for ourselves as well, okay? Let's draw attention to what we've done in the past. Okay. Those are my key points about news releases. And before I move on from news releases, I want to see if you have any questions about writing them. Do you do a lot? Yes, Kim. Uh, 
Uh, the only question I have, and, and I think that you all probably deal with this, we have several different departments. How do you make the five news releases about that day? Do you send them out, or do you try to stagger the days? Do you look at date of event, or how do you make that determination? Yeah, it's a really good question. I try to stagger my news releases. I try not to put things out on top of each other whenever I can avoid it. I try to have a couple of days between things. Can't always do that, you know? Um, so I try to think in advance about what I've got coming out. Can I hold that? Can I put that one off? Can I get this one out early if it's an announcement about an event or something? Can I do that early so that I am not in conflict with something else I know is coming out that day? So I do try to stagger them. Another way to do it is that distribution list. Does every news release you've got go to every reporter on your list? Or can you take your lists and group them a little bit? Can you target them a little bit so that whatever news release you have, this one goes to these kinds of reporters, this one goes to. You know, this might be a business news release. This might be the aging reporter. This might be the lifestyles or the features reporter. So there's different ways that you can do it. So, but it's an important question and where you can, try not to jump them all on top of each other because you'll lose coverage on all of them. Yeah, very good. Okay. You sent out a news release. You've got reporters thinking of you as an excellent source. You have a call on the phone. They want to do an interview. What do you do now? My very first advice to you is make a conscious decision about whether or not you're going to do the interview. It's exciting and interesting when we get reporters interested in what we do. We want to try to accommodate them when we, whenever we can. Some of us feel like I'm never doing an interview. I hate the media. I'm not doing it. <laughs> The idea is to think about it with a conscious voice as, do I have a message to share? Is there something I would like to be in a story about this issue? Is there something that we can say? It may not be you. There may be another person on the staff who might be better to share that story. But do I have a message? Do you have a communications person in your office, a director in your office? No. That's the, part that I left, the other part of my job that I left out. Okay. So start with Kim. Okay, I've got this call. I want you to be aware of it. It's always good if one person in the office knows all the media that's going on, but she can say, oh, well, such and such asked about that yesterday, and you may not know that because it may have been about a different program. So it's good if one person is aware so that they know everything that's going on and they can maybe help you with some perspective about everything else that's happening. You know your program really, really well. You probably have regular staff meetings, so you get a feel for what other people are doing, but one person needs to have a good sense of all the media that's going out there. Okay, so I would say go to your media person first. That person might be the official spokesperson or it might be Mr. Shaw, who's your official spokesperson. They can provide the bigger picture so they can step back from the specific question and provide that bigger picture. Know, know everything that's going on. Um, and then you make a decision. Do I do this interview? Is this an interview I want to grant? So let's talk about that a little bit. What do I ask, the reporter or myself? seems pretty simple. What's the story about? That's an okay question to ask. What is the story about? Do I have something to say in that story? Are you talking to others? Is this solely about that topic or my program or is this part of a larger story? That's going to help you understand what you need to share, what's important for you to share. You can't ask a reporter, can I have your questions in advance? It's a sign of an amateur. You don't want to do that. But you can say, generally, what are you looking for? What's your story about? What angle are you coming from? You know, what's your focus? Okay? You do need to know, is it live or taped? How long is it? Is this something you're using for tomorrow's story? What's your deadline? Do I have a little bit more time to get you some more background? Okay, so you need to know the format of the interview. Is it live, taped? What do you need? Okay. And again, in the bottom, are you the focus? Is your program the focus of the interview? Is your agency the focus of the interview? Or is it something broader? Is it about the, you know, the health um, plan repeals and replace in Washington and they just want to have a feel for how it's going to affect Owensboro? That's gonna, you're going to have a different answer to that question than if it's a story specifically about aging services in Owensboro. Okay. So you're going to want to know who the audience is. Radio is a little bit different than TV, than print. 
what is the storyline? What are they looking for? And what's the setting? How long is it? Is it a, if it's a radio interview, are there going to be live call-in questions? That's a way different story than if it's just a two-minute interview with you and the, the radio person. You could get any kind of question. Is that something you want to do? Is this too controversial? Are you unlikely to be able to assist them? Are they going to call in and say, can you help me with this specific problem? Can you help me with this specific problem? Is that a good use of your time? Think about it. It may be. This may be an ideal way for you to spend a half an hour of time answering people's questions. It may not. So understand all of that before you agree to grant the interview. You've granted it now. You're going to do it. What are some things that you need to think about? Talk about only what you own. You own child abuse prevention services. But you don't own, you talked to me and said, you don't do domestic violence awareness months because you don't deal with adult issues or things like that. Okay, so when the reporter tries to broaden the interview and ask you about the broader issues and you don't have the answer to that, you probably shouldn't be speculating or talking about that. Only talk about what you own, the information that you're responsible for. That way, you're never going to worry that tomorrow morning when you open up the newspaper, there's going to be a quote from you that is inaccurate or that's about something you don't want to be talking about. Think about Bob Newhart. He was talking about his plumber validating parking you know is that what he wanted to be talking about he doesn't own all of that he doesn't own his plumber's salary okay so he was not talking about what he owned all right you do never not have to ask questions of a personal nature you are not elected officials I would submit to you they probably have to ask questions about you know of a personal nature but that is not the case for you so this isn't about you or your feelings. When I was at the Federal Trade Commission one time, we had a reporter from Dateline NBC who wanted to do a story about funeral arrangements. Now the FTC's rule on funeral arrangements is purely a price disclosure rule. So the only jurisdiction we had with regard to funeral planning was that funeral homes are required to tell consumers over the phone what the costs of their services are. There were some bundling requirements and things like that. I told the reporter that, and she said, but would you look at online, or excuse me, hidden video that we have of some funeral practices that are going on in America's funeral homes? And I said, no, because that would be the jurisdiction of your state attorney general. They would look at fraud kinds of things or misrepresentations. We are solely a price disclosure law enforcement agency with regard to funerals. Reporter agreed. Reporter comes into the FTC. At DLN, NBC takes two hours to set up. So they're in our commission hearing room. They're setting up for two hours. I've prepped my spokesperson. I put her down in front of the camera. And the first question the reporter asks is, why won't you look at video of what's happening in America's funeral homes? <laughs> you know? I had to stand between her and the camera. I had Eileen get up and walk away. And I said, we can't speak about that because we don't have jurisdiction. But don't you want to know? Don't you care? The reporter's asking me for my personal opinion. I am wearing the hat of the FTC at that point. I am not wearing Bonnie Hackbart's hat. I speak about what I own and why I'm there. So I cannot speak about things that are happening. I said, you know, I'm, I am interested in what you have to say as a person, but I can only speak to you today as an official of the FTC, and that's not something we regulate. You need to speak to state attorneys general in the states that you're working in. They have jurisdiction. They can address the issues that you're concerned about. We ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> that was exactly where we wanted to be. Not, not withstanding all of the work I did to prep, we were grateful to be on the cutting room floor. So you do not have to answer questions as an individual or as a person. You are a spokesperson for the program of the agency that you're working for. You have the right to feel comfortable. And I'm going to show you how to feel comfortable if you're not comfortable with the media. And that's because we're going to write our messages in advance. So you have the right to feel comfortable. You do not have the right to edit or review a story before it appears. Don't ask a reporter, can I see this before you run it? Now, if a reporter says, can I review your quotes with you and facts with you before I run it, say yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Always, you know, feel free to agree to that. That's an opportunity for you to correct an error. When you do review it, if it's not inaccurate, if it is what you said, you got to let it go. Don't try and correct it because then you're trying to spin. And we're professional communicators. We are not PR flax. We don't spin. Okay? You can double check facts. You can double check quotes. You do not have the right to determine which portions of your interview are used. You might be on the phone with that reporter for 15 minutes and they use a five second quote. 
You do not have the right to determine which of the ones you use. What that means is you want to only say what you want used. And that's why we're going to talk about how to write messages and how to make sure that your messages are conveyed and how to make sure when you're answering a reporter's questions that are not exactly, not exactly in line with what you want to talk about, how to answer the question but then bridge to your message. Okay. This is just a quick slide on appearance sake. You have this in your um, packet there. Wear what's comfortable. Don't buy something new. No big jewelry. No bright colors. You want the focus to be on what you say. Not on what you're wearing. Not on the fact that your, inger, your earrings are dangling or you're wearing some really gorgeous hand-painted tie. It's gorgeous. Don't use it for interviews. Bring a plain one. Have it in your desk. Use plain. When you are seated, um, male or female, if you have a jacket or a blouse down, I'm going to step away from the mic for a second, but when you are seated, you want to seat and take your coat or your shirt, put it underneath, and sit on it because you don't want your coat all bunched up right here. Also, I'm sitting on the edge of my chair. I'm not sitting back. I'm not a cowboy. I'm not uninterested. I am engaged with you, and I'm sitting on the edge of my chair. Okay? That's really important. You may have noticed when I'm talking, I tend to lean forward. I'm engaged with you. I'm interested in what I'm doing. This is really fun for me. I am glad to be here. It happens to be the truth, <laughs> but it's a way I can convey that to you as well. Okay? When you want to cross your ankles, you want to cross your ankles instead of crossing your knees, especially if you're a female wearing a dress. This is the most unattractive portion of my female anatomy. <laughs> I don't want it showing. So when I am sitting, I am going to try and cross my ankles. That naturally puts my knees together so I'm not showing anything I don't want to show. And I am not, um, it helps me sit forward instead of sitting back. Same with gentlemen. I invite you to cross your ankles. This tends to look a little too relaxed, a little too, you know, macho, not really engaged. Or cross at the ankles. It's a tip I find, think that you'll find very helpful. Do feel free to have notes. I took notes with me on the interview I did with Mr. Shaw today. Had them sitting there if I needed. I did not refer to them. I did not have them in my hands. Put them on the table beside you. If you can have a small note card, that's better. Refer them if you need to, but try not to pick them up if you don't need them. Okay. Don't hesitate to take them if you need them, though. Absolutely. A couple of statistics that you want to refer to that you can't remember? Absolutely. Talk to the reporter, not to the camera. Never try to play the camera. We are not politicians. We're talking to the reporter. We're having a conversation. This is about credibility. We're one-on-one. -on -one. You and I are chatting. The camera's over there. We're ignoring it. Okay? We don't turn and smile at the camera or try to play the camera. Okay? And then finally, use your hands for gestures. Don't take a pen with you. You might do this. Okay? Don't put your hands in your pockets because you might have coins in there. You want to leave your hands, and I invite you to put them here. Let's talk about that. It's in, sometimes very uncomfortable, what do we do with our hands, right? We're doing in an interview, we have a tendency to do this, we call this the fig leaf, you know? Okay, we might do this, we don't know what to do with our hands. We might put them in our pockets, okay? I invite you to put your hands right here. Start with them here. Whether you're sitting down in an interview, whether you're standing up, put them right here find that they move with you very naturally, that you look more animated, that you're not stiff because you're steering the podium, that they're not locked, which also makes you look stiff, and reduces your credibility. More than half, I've seen tons of studies, I don't know what the real number is, but more than half of your credibility when you're speaking is your visual appearance. It has nothing to do with the words that come out of your mouth. You might ask me, why do we care about the words that come out of our mouth then? I would argue with you that if only half of what you're saying, you know, of what your appearance is and your credibility is the words, they better be the right words. Right? Use your hands here. You'll see I do this as I talk. I hope you see that this looks very natural. Might feel funny at first. Stand in front of your bathroom mirror and practice it. Shut the door so the kids and the spouse doesn't, don't see. But practice it. I think that you'll find it's very, very natural. Don't lock them. You can rest them together. Don't lock them. Let them move. It's very natural. Okay. During the interview, we've got some basics here. Tell the truth. Be honest. Be you. Don't try to change who you are. We talked about that. 
We can give you some tips to maybe make the words that you say a little more definitive, a little more substantive, but you still have to be you. Don't change who you are. You know, we might say it's a really neat program, but then you give two facts as to why it's a neat program. Okay? That's okay. That's you. I like it because it's upbeat. Clearly, you're energetic. You're engaged about it. You're enthused about it. I think it's positive. I don't ever try to change the way my bosses have spoken. I try to use their language and speak the way they do. They do. But just add some substance. Okay? Use simple sentences. Try to sum up something complicated in a simple sentence, but don't use first this, second this, third this, because it makes it very hard for a reporter to edit an interview. Okay? If you're trying to do a list of things, it, it just, especially in a TV or a radio interview, they may not have enough time to get your whole list in. So try to sum it up with a summary statement and then just give an example or two, but don't number your examples. Talked about jargon. Try to avoid that in speaking especially. Very important. Terms of art as well. Um, I hear, you know, we're in the philanthropy business and we hear lots of terms of art and we hear phrases like social determinants of health. What the heck does that mean? You know, you and I probably know what that means, but the media, the audiences that we're talking to don't necessarily know what that means. You know, so I might stay and said, lots of things affect your health, not just health care. How much you make, your income level, your education level, your inherited traits, a variety of things. Whether you have a safe place to walk and play. That's what I mean by social determinants. Took a little longer, but boy, it made a lot more sense. It is never your responsibility to fill an awkward silence. If you've said what you want to say, you've repeated your message, and then the reporter doesn't ask you another question, that is often a tactic to get you to spurt out more. If you've said what you want to say, sit back and wait. Their obligation is to fill the awkward silence, not yours. If you haven't set, shared a message you want to share, go ahead and use that opportunity to share a message. But don't feel like it's your responsibility to fill an awkward silence. They're paying for their time, not you. Okay? Let them fill it. Okay? Uh, let's see. Don't know what I will check is a really smart answer sometimes. And I think somebody said that earlier. I can't remember who it was. I don't know, but I'll try to get that for you. I'll find someone who, gets, who can get that for you. That's not my area of expertise. I might suggest you try another agency or something. I don't know is a really good answer because it keeps you from speculating, guessing, quoted, being quoted on something that you don't know. Okay. I talked about sitting forward, and I showed the example there. You can see how the person in the far right um, stool looks much more engaged. All right, you have two really easy opportunities, particularly in a television or a radio interview, but in print as well, that you can say your message. And they are at the beginning of the interview, at the end of the interview. Very often in a TV interview at the beginning, they say, will you say and spell your name and give me your title? Why not also give them a message? I'm Bonnie Hackbarth, H-A-C-K-B-A-R-T-H. I'm the Communications Director for the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. And today I'm here to share with you that 71% of Kentuckians support smoke-free laws. We think that's a great thing because. It's probably the best you'll say your message because you're not nervous. It's just your name, right? <laughs> You've practiced this. At the end of the interview, they say, is there anything else? You know, when we do media training as a half-day session, I'll very often start with a cameraman, and I'll come and I'll just do a raw interview with no prep. And at the end, I'll say, is there anything else? You know, nine times out of ten, that person will say, nope, I'm done. <laughs> okay. This is an easy opportunity for you to say another message. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. The most important thing I hope you gleaned today was, and state a message. If you've said that once at the beginning, once in the middle, and once in the end, that reporter goes, she thinks that's important. <laughs> he thinks that's important. You've said it three times. You've had an opportunity to say it three different ways. You know, cleaner. One of them, hopefully, is fairly clean. <laughs> you haven't stumbled. That's another point I'll bring up is, if you're in the middle of a live or a taped interview, feel free to say, let me start again, if you've stumbled. That is OK. That is a sign of a true professional. You know what? Let me try again. And then start over. That 
is absolutely okay. You see reporters doing that all the time. Okay? If, especially if it's taped. They'll just cut out the old part. If you've started along a path that you don't like, it's going somewhere and you're thinking, why am I saying this? Why is this coming out of my mouth? You just stop it right in the middle, make it unusable, say, you know what? Let me try that again. Okay. And then start again. You can even ask them to ask you the question again. That is completely professional. If you've ever watched a reporter doing a stand-up outside of your, you know, organization office before, you know, before their story goes live or whatever, they'll probably do three, four, five cuts. And these are people who are trained to do that. You aren't trained in the media. You're trained in the expertise, the, the thing that you do. So take your time to get it right. That's fine. Okay. I talked a little bit about TV's visual. I said over half is based on nonverbal cues, 7% um, on the words you say. So make sure the words you say are the right ones. We'll talk about that. Um, be personal. It is absolutely fine to use the reporter's name in the interview. John, I think that's really important, and here's why. That's absolutely okay. It's also okay to call a reporter after a story and say, that was a great story. I appreciate that you did it. Or next time, let's see if we can focus on this. I think this is a really important angle. I hope that you'd be interested in that as well. Call them. Establish that relationship. Do give them compliments. They don't feel like they've you know, compromised their journalistic independence if you do that. It's absolutely fine. They're people too. And they work, especially nowadays, they're just getting beaten up, aren't they? <laughs> okay. Smile when it's appropriate. Some people are so nervous or feel like they lose their credibility when they smile. It's absolutely fine to smile, especially when you're doing that intro. My name is, here's how you spell it, and here's my message, smile. And at the end. Now, there are times where it's not going to be appropriate to smile. Obviously, that's the case. Um, I worked as the communications director on an interim basis at Jefferson County Public Schools for five months. 100,000 kids and 16,000 employees. Somebody did something wrong every single day. <laughs> on the second day of school, uh, we lost a young man who was autistic. He did not get on the right bus. He went to a bus that he um, rode the prior year and stayed at his grandmother's house, and she wasn't there for five hours, and it took us that long to find him. Mm. Huge problem. Obviously, that's not an interview where I'm going to smile at. What I did, however, do is talk about how grateful we were that he was found safe, and that's how we started. I'm grateful here today that we're talking about a young man who's safe and sound with his family. Here's what happened. Here's why it happened. Here's what we're going to do to make sure it never happens again. It's a tough interview to do, but you have to do it. You have to speak about a situation like that. You're responsible for 101,000 kids, no matter how rogue some of them may be. Okay? We had reasons why it happened, but I couldn't talk about those because of privacy. So we had to take responsibility. The other thing that I would tell you is the interview is never over until the reporter is in his car and driving down the road. One of the tricks that I like to do when I'm doing a media training workshop is I usually train, do a half-day session when I'm doing an intense one, and I have four people total. I pull them out almost immediately one by one, and we do an impromptu interview. I've researched my questions, so I know the kinds of questions they might get asked by the media, and I've made them as tough as possible because I really want them to get some experience out of this. And if it's really, really hard with me, it's going to be much easier when they do it in real life, right? I do that interview, but then when I'm done with my questions, I'll tell the reporter or the camera guy I've got with me, I'll say, okay, I'm done. And he'll turn off the light on his camera, and he'll take the mic and put it just down here at his side. And then I'll say something like, what do you really think? I get all kinds of garbage. All kinds of stuff people don't want to say. One of the things that we do for media training when I was with the PR firm I was with is we trained NCAA athletes. We would go to athletic teams all over the country and we would train those athletes. They would talk about their fellow teammates in really horrible ways. What do you really think about John? And it was our way to teach them, don't ever do it. And they'd say, well, you said that you, know, you were just pretending to be the reporter. I said, this is about learning a lesson to never do it. You've done it now in a safe space. That reporter will not stop interviewing, and that camera is not off until that reporter is down the road and out of the building, or you're out of the building. Everything that you say can be used. Don't say it if you don't want it across the front page of the newspaper the next day. OK. During the interview, you're going to get some negative questions sometimes. How do we deal with negative questions? We noticed that um, Bob Newhart repeated a negative. 
during his interview. She said so something along the lines of, so you, you said yourself that you, know, you never guarantee your work. And he goes, no, 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 I didn't say I never guarantee my work, or whatever it was. Never repeat the negative. Instead, neutralize the negative and move to your message. And we're going to talk about that. What Bob Newhart could have said in the scenario I just brought up is, what I can tell you is that we make great progress and people really are able to deal with day-to-day -day issues so they can function, or something. He's going to have whatever his message is, and he's going to move for it. There are some times where the negative is so negative you feel like you have to address it. Again, I caution you, don't repeat it, but instead neutralize it with a sentence like, reasonable people can disagree. Here's what the data show us. That's one opinion. What we've learned is, or that's one opinion, here's our experience. Okay. And I think that you're going to find examples from time to time. Here's what the general experience is. Here's what we've learned. Here's the benefit. Whatever it is, you have to acknowledge it or neutralize it and then move on. But don't repeat the words. You know, when we were in grade school and high school, our teachers always told us, when I ask you a question, I want you to fold the question into your answer. I'm telling you, you don't have to listen to those teachers anymore when you're talking to the media. You don't have to fold the question into the answer when it's negative. And we're going to practice this in a few minutes. The other thing I would tell you is never argue with a reporter. If the reporter keeps coming back at you at the same point, I would keep coming back with that same neutralizing statement. Reasonable people disagree. Here's what we understand. Here's our position. You don't have to argue with them. You don't have to say, no, you're wrong. You have to say, reasonable people disagree, or that's one opinion. Here's what our experience shares with us, shows us. You don't have to argue. I think these work sometimes in marital things, too. <laughs> okay. A couple of quick don'ts before we practice. Never speculate or guess. You're going to be talking about what you own, so you shouldn't need to speculate or guess, but sometimes the interview goes a little broader, and they say, well, how many or what percentage? You might have something in the back of your mind, but if you're not sure, just say, let me get back to you with that. I don't have that at the tip of my fingers. Let me get back to you. Don't speculate or guess, because that could be used the next morning. Even if you follow up an hour later with the exact answer, they may not have a chance to get it, and so the wrong answer may be in. Don't say it if you don't want it printed the next day in the paper. Okay? Don't give out secondhand or repeat secondhand information. That's more about talk about what you own, not what somebody else said. Okay? Don't play favorites with media. If you're going to send out a news release, send it to everyone who'd be interested in it. Don't give it to just one reporter and not another. Now that doesn't mean if a reporter's doing really good work and they've uncovered a story or are pursuing a particular angle that you can't just do the interview with them. You don't have to turn around and put out a statement to all the media. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you're releasing information, don't play favorites. Release it to everybody that's interested. Uh, don't over or underestimate the power of the media. I talked about how many media outlets were out there. You have a lot of different places to tell your story. Um, we have a daily newspaper, there are weeklies, there are radio shows, you have a lot of different places. You have social media. I don't know if you all have Twitter and Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or whatever, but you have a lot of different places to share your message. And if a bad story gets out there, you have a lot of ways to change it. You can do a letter to the editor. You can off, uh, see if you can do an op-ed. There are lots of different ways. Media is powerful, a negative story can hurt, but you have a lot of ways to combat it. So. Don't worry too much if you get one bad story. Try to emphasize the positive rather than negative. We've talked about that. When I say the words no comment, what does that mean to you? No comment. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Anybody else? Guilty. I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm hiding something, aren't I? <laughs> Your eyes are blinking quickly as yeah. you say it. See? You're reading my body language, right? I never use those two words because they do convey some sense of dishonesty. They reduce your credibility. There are times when you cannot comment on things, however. My advice to you is to always somehow say why. When I was at the Federal Trade Commission, we were investigating Microsoft. The whole world knew we were investigating Microsoft for antitrust violations because there were subpoenas going out and reporters were getting copies of subpoenas, but I could neither confirm nor deny the existence of an investigation. And that was our official position. 
So what I would do with a reporter is they would call me and they say, I understand that you sent a subpoena to such and such asking about this issue. And I would say, I can neither confirm nor deny that the Federal Trade Commission is investigating Microsoft. Do you have a specific antitrust issue that I can talk to about? And so they'd say, well, what about this? What about, you know, is a monopoly illegal? Or whatever. That's, you know, pretty basic. But I would say, no. I can talk to you about that. Monopolies that are gained through you know, real competition are legal. You just can't use your monopoly behavior to further destroy competition. So I could talk about that. So I was still helpful to the reporter, but I made clear at the very outset I can neither, confi neither confirm nor deny the existence of this investigation. In fact, Robert Pear from the New York Times would call me regularly and say, I need your neither confirm nor deny thing. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Robert, but what's your story about? Can I help you in any way? So, there are times we can't comment. When I was with the school district, obviously you have lots of student privacy laws, okay? I can't comment on an investigation. I can talk to you about what the disciplinary procedures are for JCPS. I can talk to you about our student behavior manual. I can talk to you about all kinds of background. I can't talk about a specific instance, okay? So I tried to be helpful to the reporter. But I also followed the law in terms of privacy and served my agency's interest in terms of sharing information that's useful to people about behaving correctly in school. Okay. Let's all criticize those kinds of things. We're not politicians. We want to try and answer the question. We're going to talk about bridging and neutralizing and getting our message across, but we try not to, to, to bluff, stall, or criticize. Um, don't repeat the negative. Again, if a reporter asks you, isn't it true that... None of these aging programs are really making a difference and they're all, you know, struggling to make ends meet or I don't know, you know, whatever the question is or, you know, did the state really didn't do enough in this particular case, did they? And that child passed away because the state was negligent. You don't have to say, no, the state wasn't negligent. I don't know what the answer is in that case and we may be at a point where we can respond to it, but what you might be able to say is, we're devastated that we're in a situation where a child died. We never want that to happen. Here's what we knew. Here's what we can do to make sure that never happens again. So you're neutralizing, you're, you're, you're responding to the question with the hat on that you wear, but you're moving on to your message. And the message you want is to share with people what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen again. That's what you want out there, right? Here's what we try to do. If you see something happening, you can call this number. We wish we'd known earlier. I don't know what the answer is, but do you see what I'm saying here? Okay. Off the record. I advise people never to go off the record. I do not go off the record. And the reason is because off the record means different things to different people. Okay? It might mean you can use my words, but you can't attribute them to me. It might mean you can't use my words, but you can use the general information I give you to go to ask, ask Joe what he thinks. You could say, I've got confirmation that, or I, a source tells me such and such. It might mean you can't use anything I say, I'm just trying to give you background. We don't know what it means. And unless you have a specific agreement with a reporter, you don't have any idea what you're getting into. And in any case, they may break the agreement. It may be on the front page tomorrow. If you don't want it used, don't say it. Now, I have several friends who work in the media. We have dinners regularly or whatever. We have an agreement that everything said at dinner is off the record. But I still never say anything. But I don't want to print it on the front page tomorrow. It's just not, it's not, it's not safe. They're reporters. They have a job to do. Okay, so take care of yourself. Be safe. Okay, use facts and data. These you have in your packet. I'm not going to go into deal, detail on this. Do pause. You know, where you need to, take your time. Don't worry about those awkward silences. Ask to repeat the question. Ask to rephrase the question. Sometimes you need that just to get your head in order to come up with your answer. That's okay to do. Um, remember that interview is not done until a reporter walks out of the room or is in down the road and off. Okay. Let's talk about some of these bridging statements. Now, these are my words. They may not necessarily be your words, but this is how I speak. And these are some bridging statements that I will often use in a situation where I need to get from the answer, particularly if it's negative, to my message. Okay? I cannot speak to that, but what I can say, so in that situation where we lost that student, several reporters asked me what happened. Why didn't the student get on the right bus? Legally, I was not allowed to answer that question. 
So I had to say, I can't speak to that. But what I can tell you is that this student is now going to be guided to his bus every single day to make sure that he gets on the right bus. We have an agreement with the parents, and everybody's happy with that. Okay. So I couldn't answer the question. I didn't say no comment. But I bridged from an answer to something else. Okay. Now, sometimes I can answer the question. So I look at, let me put that into context for you. So they've said some narrow little thing, some particular individual scenario that didn't work quite right. Um, gosh, we were at a hearing last year, and I heard the age-old thing about the welfare queen getting into her limo and, you know, this kind of stuff. And, I, and so what I could do is, let me give you the big picture data. What we find is X percentage of people on welfare actually work, full-time or part-time jobs. And they're working at jobs that pay an average of this amount. So when they need a doctor appointment, they don't have paid time off work. So their skin in the game is the fact that they have to take time off work, find transportation because they're sharing a car with their spouse to the doctor's office, come back. So I'm giving them some context, but I'm not addressing the specific issue they addressed. You know, I could say we're always going to find people who built the system. What purpose does it serve me and my agency to say that? It's better for me to say, let me put that into context. Let me show you what the statistics say is the more average picture, what happens most of the time. OK? Another one. Others maybe be able to speak better to that issue. What I can speak to is x. Okay. I'm not, you know, you, you're not in the fraud department, right? Okay. I was maybe able to speak to situations like that. What I can share with you is that my experience in working with people is they're engaged, they're diligent, whatever. Okay. So you're moving to your message. My favorite is the data tell us this. The research tells us this. Here's what our experience tells us. You are speaking about what you know. You're the expert. Use that. My experience is this. Okay? I think these are really valuable. So what I want you to think about is what are your bridging statements? What are your words? Another one I like is here's what I believe to be most important. Here's the most relevant thing we should talk about there today. Here's the most important thing here. Okay? How do you control the interview? How do you take whatever it is the reporter asks you and turn it into a story that includes your message? My advice to you is you're going to develop, write down, and practice saying out loud three key messages. Not four, not two, three key messages. They're going to be complete sentences in the way that you speak. They're going to be answering the types of questions you anticipate are going to be asked by the reporter. What happened? Why did it happen? What about the future? And then you are going to move to one of your messages. So anticipate the, the worst possible questions that reporter could ask. And then write out three sentences. Now, beneath each of those sentences, you might have a sub point or two or a statistic or two. But you're going to want to use those sentences in language. And then you're going to say them out loud three or four times to yourself before you do that interview. Now, these may be sentences that you can use time and time again because you generally get asked the same kind of stuff. Or one of them may be an umbrella message that you use in every interview and the other two are specific to the interview. These need to be things that you are comfortable saying every day, day in and day out. Do you always, when you can, start off camera or start, you know, with a reporter just chatting, generally, what are you looking about? How's your story going? What kinds of information have you been getting? Oh, this is interesting. Why is it that this story interests you? Just try to get a better feel for what they're talking about. And then you want to go ahead and answer the questions and then bridge to a message. Now, I would invite you to try and bridge to a message seven out of 10 times. You're not going to get it in every single question. But you're going to get at least two at the beginning at the end, right? And then you're going to try to get in a few more times. You try to get each message at least once. You're going to try to get your important message a minimum of two to three times. Okay? You can set the agenda for the interview. It doesn't necessarily have to be the reporter. That seems backwards, right? Because the reporter said, I want to talk to you about this. But you're going to say, great, I can share with you this. I can share with you this piece of it. 
Would that be helpful to you? So you're starting this before you even agree to the interview, but then when you're in the interview, you've got those three messages. Okay? Why three? Three gives you enough places to go to when the reporter asks you different questions, you could, but, and you, but you, not too many that you can't remember them or that your audience can't remember them. Okay? So a reporter's going to ask you maybe six or eight or ten questions. If you only had one message and you kept saying the same answer over and over, you're starting to sound like a politician. <laughs> okay? You're starting to say the same thing over and over. If you have three, that's enough different places to go. Now, you'll notice that at the beginning of the interview with Bob Newhart, he said, I'll just wing it. You are never going to wing an interview again. Okay? You are going to have your three messages. The reason Bob started talking about his plumber and about validating parking and about an elected official who was deranged is because he didn't have messages to go to. He had no place to go. You are always going to have a message to go to. And that's the, really the key of controlling an interview. It's quite simple. Okay, so we're going to practice this. I know everybody has paper. You have been asked to do an interview with a TV station and you have agreed to do it. Okay? Some program that you are working on has gotten an external assessment that is quite poor, really has some critical um, elements to it. And you're going to have to make some changes to the program. And this has been made public. And so this reporter is coming to say, why isn't this program working? Why, what, what is wrong with it? Why isn't it working? And what are you going to do to fix it? Okay? I, I would like you to take the next 15 minutes, and I'll walk around and help as much as I can, to write three sentences. One answer to each of those questions. What happened? Why did it happen? What are you going to do in the future? to change it. And it's about some program you do. This is your language, your words, the way you speak. This could be a friend talking to you in church or over dinner. What happened? Why? What are you going to do? Okay? That's what I'm looking for you to answer. And this is something that you can use with your spouse, with your friends and colleagues, and with the media. But today you're writing specifically for a TV reporter. Okay? I want you to go ahead and anticipate the negative. Okay, why did that happen? The idea being, geez, couldn't you have foreseen that and prevented it? That's what they're really asking, right? So anticipate that kind of message. Okay, it's about 20 after. We're going to take until 35 after for restroom and all of that. And I've been talking a long time. I need some water. And I'll walk around and answer any questions that you have. Okay? Thank you.